Well, it is a great privilege to be able to stand before so many friends and students and men that I have gained from and been blessed by through your friendship and uh, many of you through your writings and preaching to me. And so my desire this afternoon is that the Lord would in some way enable us here to gain from His Word and that He would give freedom for that. I did notice that there were only two of us who had our passage assigned to us. Um, I think they wanted to kind of keep us from just going all over the place, brother, and, and, and settle us down. So, but the passage given could not have been uh, more a delight to me than this one. So if you would turn with me to Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and no, let's read Titus chapter 1, and we'll start with verse 1, and just kind of get the flavor of Paul as he begins. And if you would be so kind, stand, let's read the word together. Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God, and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness, in the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even His Word, in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order that which remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled. Here's the focal verse. Holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Father, open to us now your word, sir. Give that miracle of hearing. Give clarity of speech so that the preacher can say the things that need to be said. Don't let any foolishness escape his mouth, but that which is profitable and true because it's your word. We understand, Father, that because it's your word and because the power to transform and change hearts is yours, and belongs to no man, that your spirit must come and empower this word and drive its truth to the heart, cause the eyes to be opened so that there is understanding, and then move the heart so that there is obedience to that which God has spoken. And so, Lord, instruct us. We're listening. Help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. When I became pastor of Rockport 16 years ago, was my first church out of seminary, and I have to be very honest with you that I was absolutely scared to death. My prayer constantly was, oh God, please don't let me kill this church. I was a church growther by training. I had all my little notebooks fresh out of Southwestern Seminary. And for the first year or two that I was there, I pushed every program that blew on the wind out of Nashville. And it just about killed me. And I began in that first couple of years to ask myself, what, what is this all about? I mean, what is the point of what it is I'm trying to do here? And maybe the question I should have asked in seminary but didn't, what is the one thing that a pastor must do? I knew there were lots of things I could do. There were even more things that people 
wanted me to do, but what was the one thing that I had to do if I was going to be faithful to God's call? Well, my answer came in many places. One of the good things that did come out of my Southwestern experience is somewhere along the line, somewhere, somehow, I picked up this idea that a man should preach the Word verse by verse and should actually take instruction from there. And so a lot of passages began to click as I was just trying to grapple with the text and, and, and try to be faithful to teach the people who suffered long <laughs> through some of those early messages. And one of the places that I found help was in these instructions Paul gives to Titus, especially here in verse 9, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Titus, most of you understand, was one of Paul's preacher boys. Paul had led him to faith, at least that's how I read verse 4. Paul had trained him for the ministry. Paul was constantly sending him out on special assignments here and there. And now here he is in Crete. And man, does he have his work cut out for him. The people here were famously difficult. I love verses 12 and 13. Paul says, One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. Then verse 13, This testimony is true. I love that. The, here these people are. They, they, they claim that they're no good. Well, it's true. Just deal with it, Titus. <laughs> and now Paul has left young Titus on this island to straighten some things out and to set the church in order. Verse 5, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders, pastors, notice by the way, plural, in every city as I directed you. So the first order of business for Titus is to appoint elders, pastors in each city. Now what kind of men must they be? Well, verse first they must be spiritually mature. This word elder implies maturity. Someone who has walked with the Lord, someone who has gained some grounding in the truth, not a novice. Uh, Titus, 1 Timothy 3.6 says. Second of all, he must be someone who is faithful in his commitments, especially that all-important commitment of his own family. Verse 6, above reproach, husband of one wife, having children who believe, who are not accused of dissipation, and rebellion. Third, he must be a man of godly character. Verse 7, he says he must not be self-willed or quick-tempered or addicted to wine or pugnacious, which means always looking for a fight. Not so fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, and self-controlled. Now, those are the bottom line qualifications for God's man. And of course, there could and there should be a whole sermon on that subject alone. That's the kind of man he must be. And may God check our hearts this afternoon as we even think about that. But what we want to see now is what is the ministry that he is to undertake. For that, again, we must focus on this ninth verse. He must be a man who holds fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that, here's the goal of that holding, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. If the man of God would lead the people of God, he must first be a man who is saturated with the Word of God. And so the pastor's chief duty is to know and live and teach the Word of God. That's what I want to talk about this afternoon. And anybody who goes to our church was wondering when this was going to happen, so we'll just go ahead and do it now because they knew it wouldn't last. There, I feel better. First thing then, a pastor must be a man who holds fast to the faithful Word. Now this, this speaks of his personal commitment. He must be a man whose life is submitted to the transforming power of God's Word. Paul says, verse 9, that he holds fast to this word. Holding fast is to have a firm grip on something, to, to cling to something with all of your might. 
There's an NRA bumper sticker that reminds me of my fellow elder here. It says, they can have my gun when they pry my cold, dead fingers off the barrel. Well, there's the image. That's the attitude of God's man toward God's Word. And by the way, that's not just a high-sounding slogan. We are so good at sloganeering. But I think if I go to one more conference where they hold a Bible up in the air and have everybody do the same and affirm their belief in inerrancy and then put it down and never touch it throughout the conference again, I'm just going to have to kill somebody. Um, you've been there. You've seen that happen. I think that we have to understand it's not simply a slogan. It is a reality that must get hold of our souls. God's Word must be to us a treasure. Psalm 19 is talking about God's Word when it says in verse 10 that it is more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Paul felt this same way, 2 Timothy 1.14. He tells Timothy that it is a treasure that has been entrusted to you. 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, these are the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation. Verse 16, he continues, they are the God-breathed scriptures which are useful. They have, they have a powerful effect. They bring about teaching and correcting, rebuking and training in righteousness so the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Paul says to the Ephesian elders that he commends to them to the word of God's grace which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. And to Timothy, he says in 1 Timothy 4, 6, God's man must be constantly nourished on the words of the faith and on sound doctrine. The man of God must be a man of God's word. He must be a man who, who loves it, who, who knows it, who delights in it, Psalm 1, who says with the psalmist, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. The unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. God's man loves God's word. He respects it. He reveres it. He reverences it. He believes it. He studies it. He obeys it. He feeds upon it. And then he declares it. I can't tell you over the years how many very clever sermon ideas got smashed to pieces on the rock of this word once I began to try to feed my soul and read it for what it said. I mean, just some wonderful thoughts just perished because of that. And we understand here, the pastor, when he stands to preach, he doesn't come with stories to tell or entertaining antics to display. He's not there to share his experience or impress you with his eloquence. God's man has but one goal in mind, and that is to open the Word and let the life that God put in there, which is the life of His own Son breathed out through the Holy Spirit, take hold of those whom it touches. John MacArthur, in his commentary on this passage, says this, It is through the word that an elder grows in knowledge and understanding of the character of God, the will and the purpose of God, the power and the glory of God, the love and the mercy of God, the principles and the promises of God. It is through the word that he comes to understand justification, sanctification, and glorification. It is through the word that he comes to understand the enemy and his powers of darkness and his own helplessness, even as a pastor, to resist and overcome sin apart from God. It is through the Word that he comes to understand the nature and the purpose of the church and his own role of ministry in the church. All this he teaches his people. It is failure in the area of holding fast the faithful Word that is largely responsible for the superficial, self-elevating preaching and teaching in so many evangelical churches. Okay, practically speaking, then what does that mean? I think it means several things, and you can think of more than I have, but first it means that you must be clear, pastor, as to why it is you're climbing into that pulpit. You are there to preach the Word. You are there to hold forth Christ, who is the Word 
made flesh to dwell among us. You are there to preach what God has said. Now, to me, that sounds about as obvious as saying that water is wet. But unfortunately, today, you can't always assume that the man who climbs into the pulpit, first of all, that he's a man at all. Second of all, that he understands why it is he is there to speak. He might believe that he's there to give a little psychological pep talk or that he's there to make you feel better about yourself so that you can face your weak. He might be there to help you figure out how to cope with the problems of life and to manage your money. He could be there to motivate your political views so that you can figure out a way to change the world without having to bother with a changed heart. There are a lot of reasons people have for wanting to climb up into a pulpit on Sunday. I met a man when I was in seminary who went to Bright Divinity School over across town. And the more we talked, the more I realized Bruce didn't believe anything. He didn't believe the Bible. He didn't believe that Christ actually physically rose from the dead. He didn't believe any of these things. And I said, Bruce, why are you becoming a pastor? He said, I want to help people. And I said, please be a psychologist. Please, you'll do much less damage. But oh, what a responsibility that gives to us, isn't it, pastors, to be so very sure that the person, whoever they are, that the man who stands in your pulpit has this one goal in mind, to preach the Word and to preach Christ from His Word. It is that failure to hold fast the faithful word that has led to the slapstick comedy condition of the visible church. Second, be certain what this means to you personally. You must give yourself tirelessly and endlessly to the study of God's word. John MacArthur, and I'm sorry to quote him twice, not really, but... You know, it's hard to deal with the issue of the pastor and the word and not bump up against John in a couple of places. John MacArthur's advice to churches given at the Southern Baptist Pastors Conference back in 1990. And I think I finally found the text for this on founders.org. I forgot exactly if that's where I got it. But MacArthur was speaking to churches, to church leaders. He was telling them what they ought to expect of their pastors and what they ought to do with their pastors. John said, take him and fling, fling him into his office. Then tear the office door, sign from the door, and replace it with a sign that says, study. Take him off of every mailing list. Lock him up with his books and his typewriter, we would say computer today, and his Bible. Slam him down on his knees before texts and broken hearts and the flicker of lives of a superficial flock and a holy God. Force him to be the one man in all the community who knows about God. Throw him into the ring to box with God until he learns how short his arms are. Engage him to wrestle with God all the night through and let him come out only when he's bruised and beaten into being a blessing. Shut his mouth from forever spouting remarks and stop his tongue from forever tripping lightly over non-essentials. Require him to have something to say before he breaks the silence. Burn his eyes with weary study. Wreck his emotional poise with worry for the things of God. Make him exchange his pious stance for a humble walk with God and man. Make him spend and be spent for the glory of God. Rip out his telephone, and again I'll add his internet. Burn up his success sheets. Put water in his gas tank. Give him a Bible and tie him to the pulpit. Test him, quiz him, examine him, humiliate him for his ignorance of things divine. Shame him for his good comprehension of finance and batting averages and political party issues. Laugh at his frustrated effort to play psychologist. Form a choir, raise a chant, and haunt him day and night with, Sir, we would know God. When at long last he does essay the pulpit, ask him, if he has a word from God. If he doesn't, dismiss him. Tell him that you can read the paper as well as he. You can digest the television commentary as well as he. You can think through the day's superficial problems and manage the weary drives of the community and bless the assorted baked potatoes and green beans better than he. And when he does speak God's word, listen. 
And when he's burned out finally by the flaming word, consumed by the fiery grace blazing through him, when he's privileged to translate the truth of God to man and finally is himself transferred from earth to heaven, bear him away gently. Blow a muted trumpet. Lay him down softly and place a two-edged sword on his coffin and raise the tune triumphant. For ere he died, he became a man of God. I think that is a mighty word for God's people. If you're not a pastor, but you're a leader in your church, you're a layperson there, you, you, must, you must understand, you must not settle for anything less than a pastor who is a man of God's word. Demand of anyone who would dare stand behind this holy, holy desk, do you have a word from God? And if he doesn't, yank him out and send him on his way and find someone who does. That's what I expect of our elders. Two of them are here. If I cease to speak the word of God, if I begin to get cute, if I begin to come up with, with, with nice little programs that can pacify the sheep and make them think they're being fed, these men have a responsibility to yank me down from the pulpit, to tear me out of the, out of the parsonage, and to send me on my way to sell insurance or something else. It is their responsibility. But here's the other side. The best thing that I can do for my people is to be a man who knows the Word. Edwards resolved very early in his ministry to study the Scriptures so steadily, constantly, and frequently that I may find myself and plainly perceive myself to grow in the knowledge of the same. Paul commended Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15 to be diligent as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. There's a strong implication there, isn't there, that if you can't accurately handle the word of truth, that you ought to be ashamed. That to stand behind the pulpit and not have the word of truth accurately laid before the people is a shameful exercise. Ezra 7 verse 10 says that Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. Three things, to study and then to practice and then to teach. What a marvelous order. Study, know it, wrestle with it, sweat over it, parse verbs, think through structures of logic and what is being said here, practice, then I take it and I say, how is this lived in my life? What is God saying to me? Where does this fit my marriage and my children and my financial integrity? And then having done that, preach. Preach. Of course, what that means is this Bible, young men, especially I'm thinking of you, but all of us must be your regular Nourishment. Paul says, be nourished on the words of the faith. A malnourished preacher will lead to a famished flock. What are you doing, preacher, to feed your own soul on the Word of God? What are you doing beyond sermon preparation to feed on this Word and be nourished by this truth. Are you like the butcher I heard about who spent his days preparing fine cuts of meat for others but starved to death because he never took time to prepare food for himself? Remember in seminary, I, I made the classic mistake and I've warned every young man that I've ever had a chance to warn, I think, about this. Here I was in this, this world of theology, well, you know that's not true. I was at Southwestern. Let me think that again. I was in this world where they talked about theology. I was debating doctrine. I was there during the 80s, all the conflict between moderates and conservatives, and the hallways were just literally on fire with discussion after discussion. I was preparing sermons for preaching lab. I was doing street ministry in inner city Fort Worth. I was in this world of theology and ministry and, and Bible, and I was so dry. I didn't read the Bible the way a hungry man opens a fridge I read it the way a scientist looks into a Petri dish. And it was killing me. 
spiritually. I thank God. I had a friend who loved me enough one day to come to me and confront me and say, Brother, you make A's on your test and you know so much about so many things and you are worthless in the ministry. You have nothing to say that I think anybody needs to hear because it's all theory, it's all book, and it's dry and it's dusty and it's death. That, that was a man who loved me a lot, by the way. He loves you most who is willing to tell you the most truth. And brothers, the pastorate can be that way. If all you ever do is prepare sermons and cut the meat to serve other people, but you are not feeding and getting this meat on your own bones, you will die. And you need to have men around you who love you. I need these elders and I need fellow pastors who aren't afraid to come to me and say, there is dust in your words. There's no blood there. There's no life. There's, there's no having been with Christ. It's just, it's just words. You're just repeating Piper or whoever, before you ever stand in the pulpit to preach this Bible to others, get its meat on your own bones. Apply this sanctifying word to the realities of your own life. Meet with Christ there. It's so important. And then get before God wrestle through all those things, figure out a way to say this. It's, it's a sin to bore the people of God with truth. So wrestle with how to say it. Find a way. I pray I'm not sinning this afternoon. But, but wor work through it. Find a way to say it that will get hold of their hearts. And I don't mean cute tricks. I mean with the passion of someone who's been with God and heard His voice. Logic on fire. I think Lloyd-Jones called it. Truth set ablaze by the sincerity of a man who's been burned by it, whose face is aglow because he spent time in the presence of God. That's when the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and by it transforms the people of God. Third, count the cost that it will take for you to be a man of God's Word. A pastor is called to do a lot of things, some of which I actually enjoy. But I've told our people again and again to please understand that this is too much for me. I can't preach this word the way I should. So pray for me. It's bigger than me. And help me. Paul said the same thing. Colossians 4 verse 4. Pray that I may proclaim the word clearly as I ought. But there's a cost involved with that. I ask our congregation to understand that I can't be at every Sunday school party. I can't lead every event on the church calendar and every missions activity and every committee meeting that it is absolutely necessary for me to protect my time in God's Word. Now, caution, of course, you can make an idol of that too, can't you? You can be a hermit, you can be bookish, you can have no contact with your people, shepherds have to be with sheep. You have to spend time with the sheep, you have to know the sheep, love the sheep. How else are you even going to know how to apply the things that you're trying to say to them? But, but brother, guard your time with God. Guard your time to study His Word. Guard your time alone with prayer. Peter said in Acts 6 verse 2, It's not right for us to neglect the Word of God in order to serve tables. Some of you are serving tables. You may need to be praying, God, raise up men in my church who can do this. God, show us something else. Maybe some of these tables don't have to be served in quite this way. It doesn't have to look like a fine French restaurant. And maybe this is just me. I block off my Saturday evenings. I, except maybe for a prayer meeting here and there or some rare event, I find that if I mess around on Saturday evening, it just unfits me for Sunday. Maybe that's me. Maybe I'm just so very weak. But guard your time alone with God. Don't waste it on television. I've been so convicted about this lately. It just sneaks up on you. Or internet or whatever it is that 
steals your time. All right, but what about all those things I have to do? What about hospital visits and personal counseling? All these, well, be disciplined. Verse 8 said that self-control or self-discipline is part of the pastor's character. Use your time wisely. Schedule it. Make time for the Word. Block time off. Have your secretary, if you have one, help you. Have your wife help you. Have the congregation help you. But some of it we just take upon ourselves, don't we? Martin Lloyd-Jones, we heard earlier, was convinced that the very best counseling he could do was the regular weekly exposition of the Word of God. And so make priorities. That brings me to the second thing then, the second big thing, two main things here. First, a pastor must hold fast to the Word of God himself. Second, he must hold forth the Word of God to others. Do you understand that? That's not just part of your ministry. That is your ministry. Holding fast the faithful Word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that, here's the application, he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Two things there. First, a pastor must encourage with sound doctrine... Second, he must refute false teachers. First, he must exhort the flock by being faithful to teach God's Word. Paul says he must exhort in sound doctrine. The word exhort, parakaleo, to call to one side in order to encourage, to urge. Similar to the word Jesus used in John 14 to describe the ministry of the Holy Spirit, our Paraclete, I mention that only for one reason. Brother Curtis, I'm not trying to make some little fancy thing with the Greek that's not there. But it helps me to remember how these two things always go together. The Word of the Lord and the Spirit of God. The Word and the Spirit, as we've just heard from Brother Jim. John 14, 16, Jesus said, I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. Verse 26, and He will teach you all things. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5, our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to transform the people of God. Preacher, I think one of the things that means is that you are not the indispensable agent here. It's not your power or wisdom or cleverness that God uses to change people's lives. In fact, I seem to remember a time he used a donkey to change the course of a prophet. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need you. So your place, my place as a pastor is not to figure out how we can get these people on board with our program to accomplish what we think they ought to do. Our place is to bring them into contact with the life-giving Word of God in the power of the promised Spirit. It is the Spirit of God who takes the Word of God and applies it to the lives of the people of God. Spurgeon, I'm told, Many times, climbing the pulpit could be heard to mutter, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And so we preach in the power of that Spirit, and the Comforter brings His comfort. The Encourager encourages. The Helper lends His help. And the Bread of Life nourishes and strengthens God's people. Preacher, how many times, how many times have you seen that? You don't even remember what it is you said. You were just trying to be faithful to, to take the Word and to let it loose as God helps you. And the Holy Spirit took that Word and He changed someone's life. And He lifted their spirits and He renewed their mind and He transformed them. I mean, it's happened so many times. Brother, when you said this, I said that? Well, this is what God did. Really? Really? Well, he's a great God because I have no memory of those words. The Spirit of God takes the faithfully preached Word of God and transforms the people of God. Now, for that to happen, notice Paul says what the preacher must preach. And this is so very important. Paul says he must exhort, how? In sound doctrine. Now, that's vital. Don't miss this. 
It's not magic. It's not the act of preaching. It's not the preaching event that has this effect. It is the content of what is preached. And what must be preached is sound doctrine, biblical, Christ-centered, God-drenched, Spirit-empowered truth. I know, I know, you yell the word doctrine at a crowd of Baptists today, half of them duck for cover and the other half come up swinging. But... I trust that in this group this afternoon, I don't need to sell you on the importance of doctrine. If so, what are you doing here? You misread the sign outside the door or something. And Brother Tom did an excellent job telling us what sound doctrine is. Let me just remind you again what, why it matters. Sound doctrine. Doctrine, of course, is biblical teaching. It's, it's what the Bible says on any given subject. If I ask what is the doctrine of God, I'm asking what does the Bible say and teach and tell us about God. Doctrine is teaching. When Paul says in verse 9, hold fast to the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, he means which is in accordance with the sound doctrine, which is in accordance with the truth of the church, the faith once for all delivered to the saints, those things which Christ and the apostles taught us, propositional realities expressed in ways that can be understood and taken in and transformative uh, power comes to our lives. Those things, he says. Sound doctrine, on the other hand, are those truths God uses to bring spiritual health. Sound, you know, means healthy or health-giving. It's the word hygieno, where we get our word hygiene. The point being simply, I think, that it, that it takes sound, healthy content in your preaching to produce solid, healthy Christians. And it takes solid, healthy Christians to build sound biblical, alive churches. And the reason we have so few sound, healthy churches is because we have so little solid biblical teaching. So the first thing that you must do, of course, is in order to build a biblically sound, spiritually healthy congregation, the first thing is not follow every program that comes out of Nashville or Saddleback or Willow Creek or the emergent movement, but give yourself to living and knowing and teaching sound biblical truth concerning Christ in a way that brings healthy life to God's people. And I'm personally convinced that the way to do that is to give yourself to the careful verse-by-verse verse exposition of God's Word focused upon Christ week after week, year after year. I'm convinced, brothers and sisters, that it takes, it takes a commitment to be there if God will will to leave you as long as is possible, years, not months, setting forth clearly, systematically the whole counsel of God for the good of God's people. But even that, setting forth the truth, even with that, you're not done. Not only does he say the pastor must exhort in the truth, but he must also, Paul says, warn against error. He says, and refute those who contradict. Calvin said, the pastor must have two voices. One for gathering the sheep, the other for warding off and driving away the wolves and thieves. It's not enough to exposit the truth. You must also expose the error. Understand, not all doctrine is created equal. And again, as we have heard, there is true doctrine. There's also false doctrine. If some hold fast to the word of truth, others play fast and loose with that word. There's the truth of God and there are the doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy 4.1. Destructive heresies, 2 Peter 2, verse 1. If there are truths that bring spiritual health, there are errors that make people spiritually sick and bring death. Now, who's going to warn your people about those if not you? I mean, thank God for the John MacArthur's or the other people who are involved in, in apologetics, but a lot of your people aren't listening to any of them. Who's going to warn them? 
if not you. They don't all know Tony Mattia. Who's going to put these things before them? Remember what Paul told the Ephesian elders, Acts 20, verse 28. He says, be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the people of God, gathering the sheep, fending off wolves, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert. Well, Paul is saying the same thing here. Titus chapter 1, verse 10. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of sordid gain. Boy, sounds like a page out of our own history, doesn't it? He says they must be silenced. You understand, Pastor, there are voices screaming at your people from every side. Screaming at them from the internet, screaming at them from the radio, screaming at them from books and discussions at the water fountain. Liars, frauds, deceivers, antichrists. What are you doing to silence those voices? Whether Dan Brown's silly heresies that so many believe, or the subtle poison of the prosperity teacher, or a postmodern abandonment of the very idea of truth. Pastor, you have to unsheathe that double-edged sword and use both sides of it to defend them. How do you do that? Another area we could use a whole sermon. But it comes back again to this matter of sound doctrine. That's the context. It is sound doctrine that, that does this. What do you do? Let me just give you two things and we'll work toward a conclusion. Number one, Fortify your people with such a regular diet of life-giving truth that error leaves a bad taste in their mouth. When my girls were little, we never gave them a big lecture on the dangers of drinking bad milk. Okay, here's some good milk. Is that taste? Okay, get, keep it. Now, now try this. <laughs> we never had a, had, had a little exposition of what bad milk tastes like. We just gave them plenty of good milk so that when the bad came along in the course of their lives, they're sharp girls. They figured it out immediately. They knew what good milk is. The bad was rejected. Same way, what a joy it was when my daughter came home not too long ago from a Christian event and said to me, Dad, I can't believe what this preacher was saying. It didn't sound right to me. Listen, this just didn't sound biblical. Praise God. I wanted to dance. That's the first thing. The starting place. But, but, but even that, brothers, is not enough. That works for the obvious poisons. What about those subtle poisons that they can't yet smell out for themselves? What about those carbon monoxide errors? And that's what I think Paul is talking about here. He says, refute the false teachers. Notice, by the way, that it's personal. It's not just refute false teaching. It is refute false teachers. Refute those, that is, those persons who contradict the truth, who lie about Christ, who obscure His glory. It's not just a matter of exposing the lie. Sometimes you have to expose the liar. You understand heresy doesn't just float in on the wind. It is carried by false teachers. It's like a contagion. It's like a virus. It needs persons to carry it from one to the next. And Paul says here, expose them. And then he did it. 1 Timothy 1.20, Paul mentions Hymen. I knew I would do that. Hymenaeus, he must be from Wales. Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will not be taught to blaspheme. Brothers, I think, and, and those of you who know me know that this is contrary to my natural proclivity. There are some who are controversialist, and it's a different message that you need to hear. 
There are others of us who are so very pastoral that we resist doing at times those things that must be done. Sometimes you have to call names. Sometimes you need to warn your people specifically about the individuals who carry these poisons. Some of your folks are buying Joel Olstein. They need to hear that he's poisoned. They're listening to Joyce Meyer. Your students have read Steve Chalk. They've seen T.D. Jakes on national television. Who's going to warn them if not you? The minister of the gospel must use both edges of God's double-edged sword. One to encourage and to heal like a surgeon uses a scalpel. The other to fight and defend like a soldier uses a sword. You must both proclaim what is true and declaim what is false. Somebody else said that and it looked good. I don't even know if declaim is a word. But you get the idea. Both expound God's truth and expose Satan's lies and sometimes the liars who carry his mail. Now obviously, obviously that takes discernment, especially thinking about some young men who are still cage stage. You understand cage stage, right? Someone comes to the doctrines of grace, we ought to put them in a cage for three years so they don't hurt themselves or anybody else. Some of you are there and perhaps you need to hear a different message than this. There is a wrong way to do this. There's a terrible way. You don't just go hacking into a church and cutting off heads and taking names and all of those kinds of things as our brother has said earlier. You have to know yourself, Pastor. You have to know your own weaknesses. Some of you love the smell of gunpowder and like the Marines, you head toward it. You need to watch yourself. Check yourself. Know yourself. But others of you, brothers, you hold back. You're afraid to offend. You don't want to appear unnice. But what did Paul tell Timothy? Timothy. The God-breathed scriptures not only teach and train, but also correct and rebuke. Now, for me at one point in my ministry, that was an epiphany. That blew me away that they were both there. There has to be an edge to the truth. And like I said, some of you may like that a little too much, but for the most part, I suspect that for many of us, evangelical timidity and misplaced niceness have kept you from being clear and upfront and sharp when it comes to exposing or confronting those who speak against the truth. Paul did not shrink from that, even when it was Peter. Check Galatians. Peter did not draw back from that as you look in 2 Peter. Jude, the reformers. Luther went a little overboard, but he did that in a lot of things. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Spurgeon. Well, preach the truth, expose the lies, both for the health and the well-being of of God's people. And again, I'm convinced, I'm convinced myself, the normal way of doing that is faithful verse by verse exposition of Scripture year after year. doesn't mean that's the only thing you ever do. It doesn't mean you can't go off and deal with this particular subject or topic as long as you do it biblically and coming out of the text and not reading into the text and all those things Curtis was telling us. But I've found in, in, in so far these short 16 years, I've found that as I go verse by verse through books of the Bible, through passages of Scripture, I am afforded every opportunity that I need both to explain the truth and to expose the lies. Because there's nothing new under the sun, just different forms, different shapes. And going through, all those things begin to come forward. Again, I think of Martin Lloyd-Jones, majestic Romans, all the things he dealt with, all the truth he gave, all the warnings, all the exposition and and the explosion of error by faithfully rendering the word, feeding on it himself and laying it out before his people. So what is the pastor's chief duty? To so know and live the Word of God. That you're able to use it both to build up believers in sound doctrine and to refute the errors 
of false teachers. Let's pray. Father, I speak, sir, as one who does this so very imperfectly, as one who is so dependent upon your help, as one who has tripped and stumbled, as one who needs the feeding and the nourishing of your word day in and day out, as one who has nothing whatsoever to say to a group of people, unless I have digested and grasped something by the help of your spirit, of your word, and by the help of that same spirit and enabled to speak it. Father, help these dear brothers in Christ. Some who have so many marvelous gifts and abilities. Lord, some perhaps, maybe young men here who have marvelous gifts and abilities which if not shackled to the Word will destroy them and mislead your people. But if chained by truth to the Word will be a part of your blessing to a congregation and perhaps even to the world. Help us, Father, to be men and women of the Word here today. Help us to depend upon it, to trust it, to rest. Help us to speak its truth, not only from pulpits, but across backyard fences and face to face. Help us to lovingly and gently but firmly expose error and constantly and consistently uphold truth. And let Christ Jesus be seen. In your name we pray. Amen.